Hello everyone, my name is Nigel Van Evenhausen and I am a researcher with the Canadian government serving as a hydrogeomatic specialist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'm an early career researcher having worked in my field for about six years now with a few publications to my name, though there's always more projects and papers coming down the pipeline. So what exactly do I study? In grad school, I studied geomatics, which is a field that combines several other overlapping fields. Remote sensing relies on the way various wavelengths of electromagnetic energy interact with materials on the Earth's surface to map features and study processes occurring on the Earth's surface. It does so using various satellite and drone sensor platforms that capture this kind of data, like Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, and Light Detection and Ranging, or LIDAR. Many people have probably heard of LIDAR drones and LIDAR scanners and phones, but there are also orbital LIDAR platforms, which means that space lasers really are a thing. Geographic Information Systems, or GIS for short, is another important part of geomatics which involves the theory and application behind analyzing spatial data. For example, a satellite image is considered spatial data because each pixel represents the reflection of different wavelengths of light over a given area on the Earth's surface. Data science is tightly linked with modern GIS because this field typically requires knowledge of programming, data structures, statistics, and algorithms. Finally, Cartography is the remaining piece of the geomatics puzzle, as it encompasses the art and science of how we best visualize spatial data in the form of maps. Now, earlier you might have heard me mention that I am a hydrogeomatic specialist, and what does that mean exactly? Well, it means I apply my skills and knowledge in geomatics towards solving spatial problems in hydrology. So putting this all together, my job involves using data primarily from satellite sensors to map and model hydrological features and processes through time and across landscapes. These features and processes include things like watersheds, wetlands, rivers, flooding, erosion, and deposition. There are two scales of importance to the work that I do. At a broad scale, questions of why hydrology matters ultimately comes down to two things. Water quantity, or how much water there is, and water quality, the physical, chemical, and biological properties of water. Water is the foundation of human society. Water transcends politics and religions and national identities, and whether you ever think about it or not, you care about water. You would care if you woke up tomorrow morning and your house was flooded, or if no water ever came out of your taps again, or if the water that came out of your taps wasn't safe for you to use. Issues around water quality and water quantity are intractably linked with climate, and of course, a change in climate. If you look back through historical climate data sets, as I have done for several past projects, variables like temperature and precipitation are changing. And these changes manifest as changes to water quantity and water quality in important ways. Let's zoom into my work now to see what this looks like. I've done work in the Great Lakes Basin and the Lake Winnipeg Basin, which are transboundary watersheds shared by Canada and the US. But my primary study area for the past several years has been a place in northern Alberta in Canada called the Peace Athabasca Delta, or PAD for short. The PAD is an inland deltaic boreal wetland complex, and it's one of the largest in the world, about 6,000 kilometers squared. The PAD is a headwater of the Mackenzie Basin, which is something like a fifth of Canada, so it plays a partial role in regulating water quality and water quantity for a large part of Canada. Within the pad, there are hundreds to thousands of small rivers, lakes, and wetlands. Wetlands in particular are a critical component of these ecosystems because they attenuate floodwaters, filter out pollutants, can be a source of groundwater recharge in drier times, they store carbon, and they are hotspots for biodiversity. To bring humans into the equation, there are indigenous peoples that have called the pad their home and have relied on this ecosystem for their way of life for thousands of years, long before people like me showed up and pointed a satellite at it. Now bring climate change into the mix. Yes, the climate is changing, and it has changed before and will change again as part of Earth's natural cycles. We know this from lake bed sediment cores, 
from ice cores, from the geological record, from the fossil record. No scientist is arguing that this is the one and only time that the climate has ever changed. You just won't find a scientist who says that. What is different and what is concerning is the rate at which this is all happening this time. Instead of taking tens or hundreds of millennia, it's happening on the scale of decades and centuries. The speed of this change can only be attributed to anthropogenic influences, and this challenges the abilities of both ecosystems and human societies to adapt. For example, rising temperatures are delaying the onset of ice freeze-up in the fall in the pad, and also causing earlier ice breakup in the spring by days or even weeks in some areas. And this alters the hydroecology of these systems in extremely complex ways. Rising temperatures contribute to greater evaporation rates, and some of the wetlands in this system are disconnected from the greater system, and they only receive water during floods or precipitation events, which means that they dry out much faster due to increasing evaporation rates. The indigenous peoples who live here have to navigate much of this landscape by boat, and changes to water quantity and timing change the navigability of this environment, or how easily people can move around. A typical day for me is pretty flexible, actually. That's one of the fun things about doing research, is that every day can be a little bit different than the last. Most often, my days involve experimenting with code, algorithms, and different visualization techniques for all kinds of spatial environmental data. I also spend a good deal of time finding ways to automate my work with code and helping co-op students with their GIS map making and coding woes as well. And I spend hours every day reading papers, visiting forums, and even watching YouTube videos to see how other people solve similar spatial problems to the ones that I'm facing. And also to build up my skill set and knowledge, not just in my own field, but in sort of tangential fields like ecology and climate science, in which I am no means an expert. One of my favorite parts of my job is when a fellow scientist comes to me and asks me to solve some new problem. Those are the days when I feel like a kid with a new Lego set. I get to go off and explore cool new data sets and experiment with new coding approaches, and sometimes I even get to develop my own totally novel solutions to spatial problems in hydrology. And I love thinking about how a complex piece of technology like a satellite, which is orbiting hundreds of kilometers over my head, is gathering information that I can use with nothing more than my computer and turn that into practical, usable knowledge about changes to water on the landscape. I also really love the people that I work with, from the co-op students who are only around for a semester to the other research scientists who have been there for decades. Uh, and these are people who are not only brilliant scientists, but they're just great human beings on top of it. Um, it's always humbling to surround yourself with people who are much smarter than you, and it definitely makes you a better scientist. I really do love my work. Yes, it fascinates me and it challenges me, and yes, I love getting a paycheck. Who doesn't? Uh, but I'm really proud knowing that the work that I do every day matters at a societal level. I hope you all enjoyed learning about my work, and I'd like to finish off by saying a big thank you to Professor Dave for creating this Get to Know a Scientist series. Science communication is critical for a healthy society, and Dave does incredible work combating conspiracy and anti-science and demystifying not just science, but the people who do it every day. Thanks for watching.